Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm here to give you a sense for why you should give your ESP32 gift of serviceability. And maybe you're not fully familiar with either serviceability or ESP32, and I'll, I'll do my very best to, uh, to fix that. But if you think about the ESP32 um, and get confused about that uh, weird acronym with too many uppercase letters and, um, and digits, just think microcontroller or really, really cheap computer, and then, then you'll be fine. My background is from, uh, from uh, primarily working on, on the web. In 2006, I joined uh, my good friend Lars at, uh, at Google. We built the, uh, the V8 JavaScript engine for, for Chrome initially. Um, and our idea there was really to take the, uh, the, the, the browser from being mostly a viewer of static content to being a, a faster, robust foundation for so that next generation of web applications and functionality online. And that was honestly a ton of fun to, to build. And it's been great to see that sort of uh, venture into the, the broader world and with, uh, with many billions of users across uh, Chrome and, and uh, Microsoft Edge as well. So that was uh, certainly a, a fun times. And I've actually been uh, um, at, uh, at Yahoo before. I've had lots of great experiences uh, at, um, at Yahoo. And one of the things that I, I did very early on was to present some of the technical uh, deep work that we did on the JavaScript engine in Chrome. I presented that in, in 11, and, uh, and that was a, a ton of fun. I actually ventured on to do more work in the, uh, in the Flutter side of things with the Dart language, and uh, I got back and presented that in, in 2017 at Yahoo as well. And, uh, and here I am uh, talking about Toit, uh, now presenting. 2021. This is the first time where I do it uh, online, but uh, but so far so good. And I'm looking forward to uh, to having uh, conversations uh, in the in the Q and A section afterwards. So, the kind of work that I, I typically do uh, is is actually the kind of work that the big tech companies of the world do. So when I was starting the toy company in 18, I teamed up with a, a good number of colleagues from uh, from Google and Uber. And we happen to have a sort of set of great engineering sites here in, in Aarhus, where I live, um, where Google and Uber do deep tech work on, uh, on, on their products. Uh, so I found a great team there to help me build that sort of uh, next generation platform in this context for, for IoT. Uh, and we'll dive into what that means. But it's important for me to, uh, to state that I'm certainly not alone in this. And uh, we have a great team that uh, that's helped uh, build this out with, with me. The whole thing really started uh, in 2018, where we learned of the ESP32. And the ESP32 is an interesting system on a chip. Uh, it's, it, it's immensely powerful. It's a dual core, 240 megahertz RISC CPU with a half a megabyte of RAM and enough flash to do interesting things. And it comes with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in. And what sort of separates this from a lot of the other sort of cheap computers out there uh, especially the sort of the Raspberry Pi class of hardware, is really that it runs well on batteries. So uh, when you when you put it to, to, to sleep and let it uh, uh, wait there for a while, it actually goes down to uh, consuming around like 10 microamps, which means that this can run for years on batteries, not hours, not weeks, but years on sort of industry standard batteries, which sort of puts it, even though it's a very powerful chip, it puts it in the, um, in the category of microcontrollers that are really useful for building out this battery operated uh, new uh, IoT world that a lot of people are talking about. Um, and I think for many, uh, another attractive uh, point of this is really that it's, it's rather inexpensive. You can get development kits like the one I, I have here in my, my hand uh, for, for less than $10. And uh, the chip alone with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in is uh, approximately 1.5 US dollars, which makes it like a fairly cheap thing to embed in lots of, lots of things. Um, and I think there are lots of scenarios where this kind of cheap, powerful chip is a pretty uh, good alternative to a Raspberry Pi. It's a, a lot easier to manage all the software on a device that's uh, sort of um, more constrained, uh, but it still has enough power to actually fit in and be a, a compelling participant in sort of an, an open world where devices communicate with each other over the internet. Um, and I'm not the only one who believes that there is a lot of cases where uh, a device like the ESP32 is a very compelling offering. If you look at uh, something like um, uh, Banggood, um, you will find that a search for ESP32 brings up a gazillion of devices that you've never heard of and potentially a few that you have heard of. Uh, and it's just sort of exploding there in terms of people's 
uh, desire to to innovate and build things. It's just a great building block in that context, and there are lots and lots of projects that uh, that centered around the ESP32. And um, what you will not find here is is the fact that lots of uh, sort of big producers of uh, consumer hardware also embed chips like the ESP32 and the actual ESP32 as well for Wi-Fi enabling your dishwasher or for making your smart fridge a little bit smarter. Um, and so it's sort of it's, it's hiding in a lot of devices that you may have around you already. Um, and I think for me as a software guy, that makes it a really attractive target, right? Because it goes all the way from these maker projects and these areas where, um, where people tinker and try things out all the way to uh, the more industrial, more production-oriented setups, where um, where the actually the, these devices actually power uh, lots of interesting functionality around us. But the problem is, I'm a software engineer, and when we started this and we found this device, uh, a, a big question for for me and for the others on the team was like, do we really have what it takes to build like software, build code for this kind of ESP32? What would it take? Can we get comfortable working in that space? So we looked at what was there and how you would approach that. And if you're new to IoT development and writing code for a microcontroller, the place you would start is usually at the, uh, the software development kits offered by the, the chip manufacturers. So we went there. Espressif, the company behind the ESP32, offers the ESP IDF, a development framework um, that is a, a super useful uh, a way to get started on writing some code for your device. So we, we, we took that and we started working with it. But, but quickly, we, we learned that writing code based on um, a, a development framework like this comes with some limitations that we were not sort of used to because like developing for a, for a microcontroller, in many ways, it kind of sucks. I think that's the, the honest version. The separation between your code, the applications, and the drivers and the operating system is pretty much not there. I mean, it's, it, it's just like all one big bundle of stuff that's compiled together and linked together and updated together. And as a software engineer, that makes me slightly uncomfortable. We, we spend like years separating the different tabs in your browser from each other to make it possible to have functionality not interact in an, uh, in an unpredictable and potentially unsafe way. And then we come to this area where people are building like the next level of functionality for your house and you have nothing like that, right? There are no separation. Everything is built together and it's all very like hardware specific and it feels more like developing an application is not really writing user level code, it's writing an operating system. So whatever you do, you sit like right inside the kernel of the system and, and tinker with that. And for some, and maybe a little bit for me, that can be fun, but it's also a good, uh, uh, potentially fairly unhealthy playground for you. The languages that you're exposed to in that context are my favorite languages, C and assembly. Uh, I probably prefer assembly over C and I don't know why, but uh, you have to be like a low level engineer, I think, to appreciate these things. And yet with those tools, even though I really like them, I don't feel like I'm super productive in most, uh, most of these contexts. And maybe the worst part though, is that if I get it wrong, and quite frankly, I do get it wrong quite often, my errors will result in crashing the entire device. And that's, I think, a very, very bad state to be in. And it makes people that work in this space extremely conservative. If you're used to modern development practices where you want to try something out and see the effect of it quickly, uh, you probably would not enjoy going for a development environment on a microcontroller where flashing the code over a serial link uh, is the, sort of the common way to try the next version of it involves rebooting and starting over you lose all the all the state and it just kind of, it's a it's a painful experience that you have to wait minutes not seconds for for trying things out so i think in spite of the very cool things that have happened with the hardware and the microcontrollers the kind of experience you get as a developer it doesn't really compare favorably to what at least i've come to expect from servers from desktop or from mobile development and that is a big problem and i think if you look at, take a step back and think about why that is, to me at least, it feels like the problem is that we're all writing firmware. Like it's it's a sort of at least the analogy is that it's 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 firmer than than the software. Uh, so you you it's, uh, you have to get it right the first time. You can't really change your mind afterwards. And I think that that mindset and that approach to building functionality is just it comes with a big price because 
I think most software engineers prefer a model that's much more like building blocks put together, take them apart again if you don't like the result and start over. And I'm not suggesting that, that for building some foundation level software that you would always want to build your, your foundation out of, out of Lego bricks. But in terms of the ability to change things and adapt and explore, it's just like orders of magnitude faster and better. And, and I think that's, that's uh, I think that's just the realization we had that, that firmware sounds like a, sort of a weird thing in between hardware and software that has like a lot of the problems that hardware has without getting all the way to all the benefits that software has. And you have to take this with a big caveat that I am a software engineer. So, uh, so clearly I, I'm also extremely biased here. I wouldn't suggest that you would build your foundation out of, out of Legos, but I think the, the, the analogy of, of, of building and trying is, is pretty good. If you, look at, if you look at what people also sort of find hard with the firmware is that it's not just that it's sort of set in stone and it's solid, it's also the fact that all the bugs that you, you, you put into your code when you write, wrote this piece of firmware will always be there you will never be able to get them out. So this notion about getting it right the first time is really important. And uh, I'm not the only one who sort of explores the sort of the building metaphors in this space. There's a sort of a big concept of, of breaking devices. And it's a, it's a real scare in the industry that people really worry that their electronic devices due to some corrupted firmware will be unserviceable over time. They may not even function and they are sort of logically equivalent to, to a, a brick in terms of what they can be used for, which is sort of why people talk about brick devices. And they this is the biggest scare that people have when they develop uh, software, firmware, uh, code for, for these devices. For me, the biggest part here is really the, the serviced part, that that if you, if you have a device that you cannot service, you cannot deal with uh, after you've deployed it, like, it's just incredibly hard to build the right functionality for it. And your your chance of improving it just becomes it just becomes such a slow process that chances are that you'll have these old, fairly dated pieces of hardware firmware combinations around you for for decades. And I think if you look around your your living room at home, you'll find that unless you upgrade your TV every other other year, you will have devices that feel like they're they're more dated than they should have been. Uh, so I think this notion that bricking is a challenge and the problem is really that you cannot service these things is, is, a, is what we should be exploring. And for me, it's important to, to just uh, point out that being able to service something is more than just being able to observe what happens on the device. Serviceability is, I think, a terminology that's been used in a lot of different contexts over the years. But, um, but in this context, it's really building on top of a way to, to look at what happens at a device and what happens inside the device and extending that with the ability to actually go change it, reconfigure it and install uh, and reinstall parts of the software on it to, to maintain it over time. And without serviceability, observability is just a way of knowing what's wrong out there uh, and, and you're sort of lacking the tools necessary to, to, uh, to deal with it. And as, as software engineers, people that work in that part of the industry, I think we're just super used to serviceability. We expect our systems to be serviceable, even remotely. And I think even like Hollywood production movies know this. And like, there's a reason why we all uh, see people like uh, saving the world through uh, upgrading, reconfiguring, hacking systems from the outside, right? These are serviceable Unix systems. And apparently there are people out there that know how to, to work on those, even in a stressed out situation. So the real trick is with that. How do we get serviceability? How do we uh, give ourselves the, the chance to save the world from dinosaurs with an ESP32? And I really think that there are three main parts to that. The first one is really important. Like the system has to be able to keep on trucking. It must be robust and resilient uh, in the presence of bugs and faults. Like if you, if you have an, a, a platform where it's easy to do, uh, introduce critical errors that will cause the device to be unserviceable going forward, it's a no-go, right? So you have to have robust layers of software on the device that keeps you and the bugs you introduce from being critical. You do need the observability and you do need the system, the ESP32, to tell you what's going on. Event logging, uh, telemetry and metrics, they are critical tools for understanding how the system is performing and what, what happens when you run code on your devices. And perhaps the last uh, but not least important thing is that a great way of achieving serviceability for an ESP32 is to get those systems to ask for direction. 
you can think of this as maybe a more, slightly more technical thing than the others. Uh, and we just found that uh, building a serviceable system is really easy if you instruct the devices to always take direction from the outside. That means that the system, the code on the device becomes more of a set of mechanisms, an API, if you will, uh, that allows an, an outside external orchestrator to deal with servicing this in a way that you may not have thought of when you deployed the initial code on the device. So do ask, uh, do let the device have capabilities for doing upgrades, reinstalls, changing things, reconfiguring, but let the, uh, the actual servicing happen from the outside in a, uh, in a structured and prioritized way so that uh, you have a way of sort of getting out of jail and letting smarter systems that evolve faster than the code on your device uh, deal with this. And the trick is really finding a way to get all these three things on a, uh, on a small, very cheap device. And um, luckily, uh, I've, I think I've demonstrated even in, in the context of Yao over the years that, that we do have a, a hammer for those kind of things, right? Have a tool that uh, allows us to, uh, to at least come up with one kind of solution for these problems, and that is a virtual machine. The work I did on, uh, on Chrome and on, on Flutter also involved building virtual machines, software layers that sit fairly close to the, the, the metal of the device uh, and gives your, your upgraded device a way to shield off and, and uh, isolate various parts of the code. So the virtual machine here on a small device like this becomes sort of like an extension of the primitive operating system that gives you the ability to run independently isolated applications or pieces of logic. Um, and you get uh, essentially some, uh, some sort of safety rails from the system that makes it, uh, that makes the system keep on trucking, uh, even in presence of, of bugs. It, uh, it gives you uh, this, this fantastic way of letting the system ask for direction from the outside. And we can build in enough serviceability and observability tools that makes it possible for you to, to actually build an API and a way to service these things from the outside, even in a, in a cloud way. So with a virtual machine as the enabler on this small device, it's possible for us to give you a way to run containers, manage them through the cloud, even on a microcontroller. So we, we have a way, technology here, to build a sandbox environment for your ESP32 code that can be controlled through a rich cloud API. And I mean, I know that sounds fairly high level and I'll dive into what it really sort of what it looks like and what it means. But, but if you think about it, this sort of brings working with microcontrollers much, much closer to the way you would work with services that run in Kubernetes, in Amazon Web Services, or the way you would think about uh, managing the applications you install on your users' uh, cell phones or mobile phones. So, so it's, it sort of brings some of the concepts from desktop, from server, from, uh, from mobile into this, into this space. Um, and the way it looks um, is really that at the core, uh, on top of the, the, the raw ESP32, uh, we do use that fairly sort of primitive real-time operating system that's bundled up in this uh, uh, development framework from the SPC uh, people. But this is also where it ends, right? We install a small piece of firmware, and this is our virtual machine on top of that. And with that, the rest of the stack is really software that can be changed, updated, manipulated. They run, the applications here run side by side, they are isolated from each other. And it's a big, fairly stark contrast to what we have with the system where everything is firmware, everything's compiled together, everything's linked together and updated together. And with this kind of model, at least for uh, the stack that sits on top of the software, uh, sorry, on top of the firmware stack, uh, you get something that is much closer to what you would get from running, say, Linux on a Raspberry Pi, where you also have independent processes and a way to have a code that's written by independent teams coexist in a meaningful way. With this, you can actually do essentially the same kind of things as you would from a sort of a cloud management perspective for a, for a, for a, a set of services running in Kubernetes, right? You can get an overview through a console that gives you like a dashboard for your device fleet you can gain insights and monitor the system, and you can change and experiment on these devices all through this sort of a, um, API enriched set of devices you have out there. But at the core of it, it really is an, an API for, for servicing your devices. And the kind of things you wanna do with devices uh, is, isn't really that sort of novel, right? It's, it's updating configurations that happens a lot, but it's also installing, updating, and removing applications. 
Um, a lot of the Internet of Things is centered around data and the value of data. So you need a way to publish and subscribe to data that flows from these devices. And clearly, because devices need to be integrated into pretty much uh, all kinds of services that, that are pre-existing, you need a way to do this and a way to build this API so that you can, uh, you can integrate this into whatever functionality, whatever uh, tool that you have in the front. And we found that using Google's RPC mechanism, RPC, uh, sort of a high performance open source RPC framework to be a, a fairly good way of doing this. This is a way of expressing an API with a declared uh, services and, uh, and uh, data types and get an efficient way of, of communicating over the wire and using this from, from many different languages. Based on HTTP2 in the transport, uh, it supports everything we need in terms of streaming, authentication and everything else. So. So it's, a, it's been a, a very good tool. I think you'll see more, like many companies that include people from, from Google have, have this in their toolbox. It's a, just an immensely powerful uh, thing. If you're familiar with Protobufs, this is sort of the logical um, that was built on top of that as the wire protocol. And it's a, it's a very, very reasonable starting point for building APIs that can be used from uh, many different settings. But, but with this sort of API for your devices, you have a way to get source code and it's really hard to find an illustration for source code so i went to hollywood again uh, not my favorite movie but yet uh, something that is uh, labeled with with source code it's a way to get source code i think this is the coolest thing to flow through a cloud-based api then over wi-fi or a cellular connection like narrowband it onto these small devices so the api is so rich that it allows you to pass in a string that we interpret as as source code for your program and let that flow and be deployed to hundred thousands of devices out there. So in some ways, gRPC uh, is, is not that, that all important to us, but it's a great way of just exposing that API that allows you to say, please install my application across this device fleet. Here's all the code for, for it. And, but that, that sort of string and that set of code that you provide us with is really built in a, in a custom programming language that runs on our, on our virtual machine. And uh, I've got a couple of decades worth of experience building implementations of languages and a little bit less than that building uh, and designing the languages uh, too. And we just found that in, in this context, we could just implement a language that was much more uh, efficient um, for this class of devices uh, and, and still be a sort of a high level language for, uh, for writing for microcontrollers. So with our API and our custom language, you have a way to, to talk to and get devices to do what you need them to do. And I think you need to see the language just a little bit to get a sense for what we actually built and what we put in front of, of developers. Uh, it's indentation based like Python and a lot, of, a lot of functionality that we put in here that's, um, that is like uh, um, the, the equivalents in, in Python, but it's, it's very straightforward and simple with a uh, simple sort of class-based uh, imperative language. Uh, so, so in many ways, no surprises here, but it runs very efficiently in these devices, which is the main selling point. Um, you can define functions and you can, uh, you can add static types uh, like you would expect in a system like this. Syntax is a little bit different than what you've seen before, but the implementation works well in this, this context. Here is a method called square. It takes a single parameter x and returns the, uh, the product of x times x. Um, we have a similar function below where just it's a sum instead, uh, but it's sort of relatively straightforward. You can tell a lot, lot, a lot of parentheses and a lot of uh, things we use the indentation fairly heavily here. And it gives us a, a, a lightweight scripting feel to the language, uh, which I think we found that services our customers and users really well because they typically start out writing code that feels a little bit more like configuration than, than actually big amounts of, of code, right? Because the kind of problems they often solve with these devices start out fairly simple. Measure temperature, get the temperature from a, from a sensor, bundled up somehow and forward that to the cloud. All those things are sort of nicely expressible in a high level scripting language like this. If you take a step deeper, clearly you also need support for interfaces and classes here. Uh, and here we have a, a car class that implements a, a vehicle interface um, with a single method drive that takes a parameter speed. And you can see how that can be, can be used below. It's a sort of a light and, uh, and so far we found that it, it works extremely well for the, the kind of problems that people solve with these the setups. If you look at sort of one of the areas where we did invest some time in coming up with a model that we feel like is, is, is better than the alternatives, we, we uh, took a uh, page out of the 
the Smalltalk manual and looked at how Smalltalk deals with blocks of code, um, often sort of thought of as, as closures or lambdas in some other languages. And we just made it possible to have this very lightweight way of expressing uh, custom control structures where you could define a method called when, six condition, and a block of code. Um, and then you can actually just use this when construct exactly like if, if it was an if or, uh, or for or a while, it looks exactly like a built-in language construct. Uh, and it just gives you a lot of flexibility to introduce your own control structures here. To make this sort of a uh, built-in feel to it uh, very real, we went all the way of actually adding uh, what is known as non-local returns and uh, ways of sort of breaking out of and continuing from within these blocks. So it's possible from in within what some, some one of these blocks to return from the, the surrounding method, the method that contains the block, not the block itself, which means that the things you can do in a, in a, in a then a part of an, of an if statement can also be done from a block like this, which is all sort of for the small talk folks out there is, is just very well known, but this notion of being able to wrap a piece of code that does something that used to be in an, an if, uh, if structure and put that into something that is more specialized and solves your, your needs better is just immensely powerful. Um, in, our, in our context here, uh, these blocks are all stack allocated, so they don't float around in the, in the heap, so it doesn't put extra uh, memory uh, pressure on the, on the system, uh, but it does come with a, a few uh, limitations here. Um, in terms of your ability to store these blocks out in, in other objects, but sort of passing them down, using them as a way to implement uh, sophisticated uh, control flow is immensely powerful. Um, we also added uh, we also added support for um, cooperative uh, tasks. Let's see if uh, if the screen here changes. To this. there we go. Um, so so you do have a way of of, of Sort of within one application and one one isolated memory region to have multiple independently executing uh, tasks and one silly way of using that would be to say let's do a, a sorting algorithm that's based on on sleeping and here you see us creating a list of random numbers 10 10 shots numbers printing them out and, and then running through these numbers and starting a, a a small task that sleeps for that amount of milliseconds and then prints the value. And the result of that is really a, a nicely printed list of, uh, of, um, of integers here. I wouldn't recommend you uh, to implement this sort of a sleep-based sort in your production systems just yet. Uh, um, but, but if you feel like uh, exploring the space, we could definitely uh, come up with some, some way of doing it. But, but at least it sort of just illustrates that you have like lightweight tasks and they can uh, engage with each other and, and you can build on this. So. To make it slightly more interesting, I'd love to just give you a sense for how we built the system, how we built the virtual machine that powers this, and um, and it's sort of it's more of a sneak peek into the engine room that it's a uh, that it's a full blown uh, walkthrough. Um, but the uh, at the core of it, um, I'm just going to show you how maybe the most important thing in a virtual machine like this that works. Um, here we go. The slide changed a little late, so uh, forgive me if I'm slightly confused by that sometimes. But a sneak peek into the engine room. Um, let's look at how we've implemented uh, method, method calls, something as simple as calling the append method on some object, in this case called months, and passing a, a string to that. How, how do we go about doing that? Uh, in the systems I worked on before, we would trade essentially memory for making this efficient. In JavaScript and in Python, the way we implemented fast dispatches was to cache lots of information about what used to happen when we call append here, which method did we actually usually hit there. And then based on that small piece of uh, dynamically changeable memory, we could make quick decisions, do a quick check, and just jump straight to the right piece of, uh, of code. But, but in a system where memory, where RAM is very precious, spending RAM on, on just sort of the basic uh, ways you run code on the device just feels like the wrong trade-off. You really want to be able to to run straight out of flash without having artificial extra RAM-based sort of caching, me caching mechanism going. So we just found a, 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 an old classic uh, approach to doing this where we, we do what's called selector-based um, selector row displacement, where you essentially combine all the possible methods you can call into one big smart table that allows you to make decisions based on a, a, uh, on a structure that, that fits entirely in flash, doesn't need any RAM to, to work. 
So, so the way this actually uh, works is that it starts with a, a depth first numbering of the class in your system. And you can imagine that you have uh, these, these six classes, A, B, C, D, E, and F, in the, arranged in some inheritance hierarchy like this. And when you do depth first numbering, you get this nice property that all subclasses of a, different, of a specific class, sort of they form a, a range of numbers here. They're numbered together adjacent. So all the subclasses of class B are in the range one to three here. So that if you inherit a method from class B to the C and the D classes, they group together and they fit together nicely. So if you look at like an append method implemented on the class B and on the class F here, um, the way you would construct like a, a table row for just that method would be to say like, if you call this on a, on a class A, if you can, then, then nothing should happen or it should fail. But if you call it on, on a B or a C or a D, you should call that B.append method. If you call it on E, it's an, it's an error. But if you call it on F, you're supposed to get that separate method called from, from F.append. So you get this sort of inheritance mapped out into sort of copying the B.append entry into all the subclasses that sit together nicely there. So you can easily construct this kind of table for a method like append. And you can do that with all the methods in the system, right? And that gives you sort of a, a set of rows that, that could look something like this, right? For append, for concat, and for remove. They also have implementations that, that have, there are some holes in there, but there are areas where they, where they make sense, where they, where they function. Um, and the, the trick then is just essentially getting, a, getting out of uh, the problem of paying for all the holes. Because if you, if you combine all this, like this table, set of tables become really, really big. And to get out of that problem, you essentially just overlay them. It, it's, it's quite straightforward. You just shift them to the right here and you sort of displace them a little bit. Uh, so that means that the, um, the, the colored part of the, the concat here just fits in that hole in the append uh, vector or table row and remove is sort of moved all the way to the, to the right here. And through that, you form a um, combined row uh, where there are less holes than there were before. Uh, you cannot get all of them out, but you get, get like, by far the, the majority of them out. And that means that to use this row to call a method, you just take that, that number for your class um, and you, you add the displacement to that uh, for that method that you're looking for. And you, through that, you can sort of find an entry in this combined table. So if you wanted to call append on the C class, on an instance of the C class, you would take the index of the C class, the number two, and you would add the displacement we've computed for append, which is zero here, and look up in the table and find entry two. And more interestingly, maybe if you want to call concat on an instance of C instead, you would have to take the displacement into account and add two in this case, the extra displacement for concat. And that would leave you at the, um, at the, uh, the fourth entry instead where you find the right method. So with this, you can put all of this um, all this functionality, you can put this uh, uh, in one big table that fits in Flash, and you have an efficient way of calling methods in the system. And this is sort of a bit of a deep dive into sort of an area where, where sort of working on the technology is, is important to make it possible to do more things in this, in this context. But I find it super interesting that we, we found sort of a, a set of sort of old techniques here used back in the day, and we can sort of bring them into uh, modern world and, and start using them to power containers or microcontrollers. There's just something really nice about sort of a, a circling back and finding techniques uh, that can be useful in contexts like this. So I know this is super abstract. So I think just to give you a slightly more uh, sort of hands-on experience of, of the system here, I'd love to just uh, jump into a, a really quick glimpse of what, what it looks like, what you can do with it, and um, just give you a sense for why you should care about containers or code on microcontrollers. And to do this, I'm just going to flip over to um, a, uh, another window here. Let's see if I have it here. Yes. And I'm going to try to power up this, uh, this ESP32 I showed you before. Uh, after I just uh, started using the tool, I sign in with Google. And uh, with any luck, uh, I get into the, uh, the, the console here which I uh, outlined that is a way to, for you to get an overview of your devices and see how your fleet of systems out there is, is performing. And as you can tell right now, the device claims to be unhealthy and uh, not in a great state. But if I, uh, if I add power to it from my, my power bank here, um, and I just wanted to show that it's actually on a, on a power bank, not connected to my machine. It's, it's a purely Wi-Fi based system. 
the device will go online and become healthy. And with that, you actually have a serviceable little computer here that you can, you can run interesting things on. So if we, if we go to this and start looking at how it's been performing over time, uh, you have some insights that are useful to just give you a sense for what's happening. But I, what I really wanted to show you is just that through this, you can write code on your device and get it to do things for you. Uh, and the best way of doing it is just like running code on it. So we can run Hello World on the device. We compile that piece of code and we push it through our APIs and we distribute that over Wi-Fi uh, to this device, run it on the device and get it back again, all without restarting the device, without waiting for it, it just, just runs, uh, which is sort of what you would expect from a software side of things, but it's sort of a, a little bit novel in the in, in context of, of these devices that are fed in. And clearly we can we can go write some, some more code here and, and say let's write a Fibonacci function that says like if less than two will n and then we'll turn like fib of n plus fib to run that and that shouldn't do anything. We didn't call it yet, and we'll just go call it again here. Fib of 10. Do string interpolation to call fib of 10, and then we'll just run this on the device. And oops, I made a mistake here. So uh, the code is wrong. It goes, it gives me a stack overflow. The device is still running here, but apparently I typed in something wrong here. This should be n minus one. But with this system, right, even though I got it wrong, I introduced the bug here and it didn't really give me what I expected. The system doesn't restart or lose connection. It just keeps on trucking, allows me to try something else, right? So it's really straightforward for me to just go fix this bug, work on it, go to the log, see what's happening on the device here. So this, this way of, of feeling very comfortable when you demo things, it's, it's one benefit, but also when you develop functionality, when you work with this, even though it's running on a less than $2 device, you have this sort of safety rails built in that makes you comfortable uh, working with the device. Um, and it, this goes pretty much all the way through the system, right? We can go here and do like a high level reconfigure and say, I actually, I'm perfectly happy with this device only being online. Sometimes it can be offline for up to a minute at a time. And just by telling you, telling it that, uh, the device will actually now after um, having uh, process the request from the outside, it will now actually start um, going into to deep sleep, sleeping for the vast majority of the time and only coming back uh, to uh, fulfill the need that I described for it, uh, that I wanted it to be not offline more than a minute at a time. So um, the device is now sleeping, consuming uh, around 10 microamps um, as it does this. And it still uh, is, is a part of a, uh, of a system that is, is serviceable, just at, at sort of slightly delayed intervals where, where you have to, well, wait a little bit before it comes back on. But let's see if, uh, if we get to a point where it actually uh, will, will reappear and tell us that it's, uh, it's reconnected. Um, it should not make, take more than a minute, but I guess a minute in, uh, in demo time is, is a long time to wait. So uh, we'll see. And with this, um, I'll, I'll go back to the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the main part of the presentation and just to uh, tell you why you, you should care about, uh, care about this. Let's just, before we look here, it's, a, it's now an offline device. Uh, I extend it and you can see that. So let me go back to the, to the main part here. Hopefully you all now see the, uh, the purplish, uh, purplish color here. So with that, you, you got a, a really, really short glimpse of how the, the, the platform works and how you can work with devices in the setting. And for those of you who really care about the, sort of the inner details, uh, here are actually the, the, the instructions, the, uh, the, the byte codes that the device executes to run this Fibonacci function. Um, and as you can tell here, there are fairly sort of high level instructions for working with local variables, invoking uh, operations like uh, less than and minus and plus and calling methods that are uh, statically defined there as well. Uh, so, so no surprises, but sort of just uh, the way you would construct a, an instruction set for a virtual machine that can, that can run on, uh, on various different devices. So, so the, the reason why I'm, I'm sort of showing you all this is that I think we, we, we do have a challenge ahead of us. Um, something that we as a, as a group of software people should, should try to tackle. 
And it's really the fact that the, uh, the devices, the number of devices out there is, is continues to grow at a, an immense pace. The, the hardware uh, development uh, does not seem to, to stop the, the ways we connect devices and the way we interact with them over, uh, over uh, wireless connections keeps uh, getting better. It's now possible to get SIM cards that gives you global data roaming at a very reasonable price for these devices. And we are approaching uh, like billions of, of this kind of devices out there that need functioning, serviced, innovative functionality. And without a good platform, without good um, um, sort of foundational software on these devices, a way for you to, to write your logic and not worry about breaking the devices, without a way to upgrade these things and work with them, um, even if they're remote and even if you need to service them from across countries and time zones, it's just impossible for me to imagine that we will come to enjoy having 5 billion cellular connected devices out there. This constant fighting uh, with uh, not updated, not maintained devices is not going to get better. And I think we've seen a few cases where some industries have realized this. I think if you, if you go to Tesla, they will talk about their functionality on their, in their cars as software, not firmware. And I think this is just sort of a trend that we cannot reverse. Like This is the way it's, it's going to happen. They are going to start pushing functionality through software updates that will improve, hopefully improve the way they brake and the way you control the, the, your car. And it's sort of an extreme in some ways, because I think most of us get a little bit scared by that. But imagine that, uh, that they didn't do this, right? And, and you would get uh, stuck in a world where it was impossible to, to keep improving things. Or imagine a world where you had no way of updating mobile apps after having put them on your users' devices. There's just so many things we would be missing out of. And I think that's, that's really where we are today with, with IoT. We have all the building blocks. We have the right compute, the right chips. We have the right connectivity. We just need a way to get the software folks involved more. And I think this could be one of those ways. So we've started out with, um, with packaging up an end-to-end -end platform for ESP32s. You can deploy your solutions on microcontrollers and run them for years on batteries uh, without giving up on serviceability. Clearly, ESP32s is, is just a starting point. I think most people that are in the microcontroller space, I think they, they know um, that, um, that there is a, a lot of uh, different options out there and a lot of different um, uh, SOCs that are interesting, but we just found that this was such a compelling uh, device, such a compelling hardware platform that we wanted to try, start with that and try to bring that into to a modern world in terms of the, the way you think about software and the way you, you write your functionality. And we worked on this for more than three years now. The platform is, is open and easy to run on your own ESP32. So you can sign up today for free and try it out. Um, but I think the most important thing is really that, that we're, we're, we're seeing a future for IoT that's much more software rich and way less focused on firmware and hardware in some sense. You know, Internet of Things, IoT, is so focused on the internet, the connectivity part, and the things part, the hardware. And I guess we're just sort of missing that focus on functionality in here as well. Um, and, uh, and through that, uh, hopefully better experiences for, uh, for all of you that have devices around you at home or devices in your, um, in your, um, in your, uh, in your retail stores or in, in, uh, in factories around the world. So, um, so I really encourage you to, to give it a try and get a sense for what this could, uh, could look like and what you could build with this, this kind of thing. At least think about how you, as software engineers, can uh, come to the microcontroller side of things and, uh, and start exploring and building. With that, uh, I think I'm pretty much out of time. Awesome. Virtual round of applause in the very quiet chat and from the muted people here in the backstage. It's very interesting to see inside some hardware-ish stuff. So questions. First one is from Lee. What are the security concerns with patching the system with source code string over Wi-Fi? So you could say that stringing source code over Wi-Fi sounds a little bit dangerous. I sort of agree with that. The way we do that is, is really that you send your source code using completely standard public-private key encryption to a, 
the cloud APIs. And from there, it's actually translated into something that runs on the devices. And everything that we do in terms of sending bits and pieces around here is, is over uh, encrypted uh, communication. So it's not just a broadcast via Wi-Fi. It is uh, much more structured than that. So we're sort of just basing our stuff on the, on the same kind of uh, security mechanisms that you would use for your internet banking. And, uh, and, uh, and we're sort of spicing that up by insisting on having device specific certificates on, on, on every device so that, uh, that the authentication works in, in both directions so that the cloud API knows that the device is trusted and the device also knows that it's uh, talking to the right kind of infrastructure. So the next question is from Scott. What's the memory footprint of the Toit VM? So the memory footprint of the Toit VM, I mean, sort of comes in, in two parts. There's the, the static footprint and the dynamic footprint. And the static footprint, uh, when we bundle everything up, including the network stack and uh, the, uh, the, the encryption um, ciphers, like the TLS support, it, it adds up to around one megabyte of flash uh, for, the, for the, the, the static part. In the, in the, in the, the net dynamic part, the RAM part, we're seeing overheads in the vicinity of like 30 to 40 kilobytes. Um, and you can get small applications running in a couple of kilobytes on this, but the stack takes some space and it's mostly buffers for the encrypted communications uh, to, the, to the cloud side that takes up a uh, RAM practice. Next question is from Anonymous. Why did you develop a whole new programming language? Well, that's a really good question. So we actually had at least a day where we were looking around and thinking about whether or not we could take something like Python that is much more sort of uh, well-known and established out there and, and bring this into this. And we looked at options there and there's been some really, really, really solid work being uh, put into micro Python mm -hmm. on these devices as well. It's just that the trade-offs involved in running something like Python on these devices just didn't feel very um, like the right trade-offs for us in terms of static footprint, RAM footprint, but also so just like robustness and performance. And with, with just tweaking the language a bit and making it slightly more um, analyzable and uh, statically declared, we've been able to, to get something that's sort of just by building it right, it's like 30 times faster than, than anything Python based on these devices. And we're just not willing to let a factor of 30 uh, just uh, pass us by. And we think that that is the kind of Sort of approach we've taken in the past and we've been very successful with just sort of inventing and changing sort of the status quo where you can get like orders of magnitudes of improvements here. So that's what we went for. I think we, we appreciate and understand that new language is always challenging. Uh, it's just we find that not doing it um, sort of would not give us a, um, an ability to really sort of fundamentally change what you can do on these devices in a high level language. Fair enough. Next question is from Richard. Did you do anything special to support talking to attached sensors and output devices in the Toit language? So at the, at the language level, we've done um, relatively few things. We, we made a really efficient way of, of, uh, of transitioning from the high level language into the lower level sort of underpinnings that's necessary to, to talk SPI or I square C or, or UR here at, at the right performance. But at, at the core of it, uh, it's mostly about exposing uh, that sort of peripheral interfacing uh, libraries uh, and making them high performance. So that it's, it's straightforward to hook up a, a device over one of those established protocols and just uh, run with there. So we, we see lots of sort of user level drivers being written in Toit, where people just use the I square C interface that we provide them with to uh, hook up to their uh, sort of off the shelf sensor that they've got from, a, from some company and just start uh, getting data out of that. Some of the more complex sensors uh, or peripherals, if you will, that are out there are uh, GPS mo uh, modules or uh, cellular mo uh, modems. And there, I mean, the world is still packed with like serial communication and AT commands. I don't know how many people remember AT commands of the past, but they're still very present here, right? So in some sense, all we had to do there was make it really easy to write AT commands from a high level language just send them to the to that external module and just be very good at interpreting the results we get from there. So just say, pick the right kind of ways to um, hook up to the peripherals and then, then let, let the rest sort of happen at a higher level. Um, that, that's worked pretty well. But very few things sort of fit into the language. 
maybe except for this um, lightweight task structure that, that does give us the ability to, to essentially wait for events from something instead of having callbacks and interrupt handlers and whatnot. It's just like a more straightforward from approach for most developers, I think. Okay, next question is from David. And you, you may have answered this already in a previous question about security, but he says the common joke about the IoT, sorry, the common joke about IoT is that the S stands for security. Do you see this platform as addressing this in some way? Yeah, I think we are addressing it in, in some way, right? Security is, is difficult, right? Because it's always, if done well, multiple layers of uh, approaches that you apply here. So we started out having very sort of opinionated approaches to the way you would communicate with your devices, insisting that, that they always go over encrypted uh, channels. Um, but you could say that the core idea of running a virtual machine where you isolate your logic um, and allow people to express smaller components and get them separate also gives uh, sort of a healthy starting point for writing more robust and more secure code because the system will give you certain guarantees in, in, in terms of which areas of your code can touch which part of memory. So, so that just the way that, uh, that a, like a high level language like Java or C Sharp or JavaScript even does sort of give rise to a higher level of security than running straight machine code on your device, uh, we sort of get the same benefits here. So like buffer overruns and, and stack overflows being a problem, it's, sort of a, a, it's not really a thing for us, right? So I think at the core of it, high level and managed platforms does, does provide some building blocks, but clearly it's all um, sort of levels and uh, we're, we're really trying to innovate and, and secure the, the foundation. Uh, but your, your application logic on, on top also needs to make sure that it's not exposing surface area that others can control and, and deal with from the outside. And this is hard for us to guarantee other than insisting on encrypted communication. Okay, and last question from Lee. Is the upgrade path via the orchestrator sort of like Erlang's message passing slash actor model for self-updating? It's, uh, it, it's pretty close to that. And um, then we had a lot of inspiration from, uh, from Beam and from, from Erlang as we, as we uh, spec this out and we started implementing it. Uh, so the way we usually do these things is that we find it so hard to maintain state over these updates that we'd rather not. So we, we sort of do like pull down entire applications, including all the different processes that they run and, and restart them in a, in a much more structured way. And that's all the, the Erlang inspiration that, um, it, uh, that, that comes into play there. It, it really helps that, that our users' applications often have to be written in a style where they, they, they understand that they will probably be put to sleep at some point and get sort of resumed again later. Uh, so the, the way you write code on small devices where you like it's very common that RAM gets cleared out quite quite frequently because of the, the sleep patterns. It's just different than the way you would run, run sort of a, a long and persisting process in a server-side system. So it's not everything in the Erlang space that we can just use, uh, but some of the, the core ideas and this way of, of allowing people to, to have like version one and version two of the same app run side by side by just using the separation, uh, we still think that's a, that, that's a really good idea and something that we happily uh, integrated into our thinking of uh, of this uh, this problem.